The subcommittee hearing will reconvene and we'll begin uh, with uh, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Burgess. Well, I thank the chairman for yielding. Um, the hearing this morning focuses on an important public health issue, obviously a significant impact on our nation and a crippling effect on our budgets. And we've already heard statistics from a number of members this morning, so I won't repeat those, only to mention that my home state of Texas over one and a half million people over the age of 18 have diabetes, and in our state it is the sixth leading cause of death. Two bills uh, which I would like uh, this committee to consider to move expeditiously and mark up. Of course, we've already heard about H.R. 3668. Representative DeGette uh, would reauthorize the special diabetes pr programs for type 1 diabetes. And this program was started back in the 90s under the guidance of then Speaker Newt Gingrich. And he continues, as do I, to support the innovative work of this program. In fact, there have been some rather dramatic things that have come out of this program, including autotransplantation of beta cells from people who have had a traumatic disruption of the pancreas. Now, I also have a bill the gestation with uh, Elliot Engel, the Gestational Diabetes Act of 2009. Having practiced uh, as an OB-GYN for over 25 years, clearly well aware of the problems of untreated gestational diabetes affecting over 200,000 pregnancies a year, over 7% of the pregnancies in this country. And they can have significant impact on both the mother and child because they are at significant risk of developing type 2 diabetes and mothers are almost three times more likely to have a recurrence of gestational diabetes in further future pregnancies. As with other diabetes trends, the rates of gestational diabetes are higher among women of African American, Hispanic, Asian, and Native American descent. H.R. 5354 creates a research advisory committee headed by the CDC to expand monitoring, including coordinating efforts to help mothers avoid contracting type 2 diabetes. So I would urge <coughs> members of the committee to uh, co-sponsor this legislation. It does just so happen that I have a sign-up sheet for anyone interested in co-sponsoring this bill, and Mr. Engel and I would be happy to take that to the floor to save you the trouble. Um, while we hear about the increase of obesity in the United States and has raised the prevalence of diabetes generally, we also need to hear about the impact of genetics, ethnicity, and maternal age, particularly in the case of gestational diabetes, and focus our research on much of the diabetes, how diabetes cost can be reduced through better lifestyle choices. With the correlation between obesity and lower income levels in diabetes, uh, this committee really needs to stress being involved in encouraging proper nutritional choices for our populations that we serve under Medicaid, which is under our jurisdiction. So I thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will unbelievably yield back the balance of my time. I'm supposed to take notice, I guess, right? All right, thank you. Thank you, no. <laughs> Next is the, the gentlewoman from the Virgin Islands, Ms. Christensen. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and um, Ranking Member Simkus for holding this hearing today to discuss the yet unmet challenges facing us regarding diabetes. And thank you also to uh, Diane DeGette for her leadership on this issue. I'd like to welcome our witnesses today and um, both panels and recognize in addition the 60th anniversary of the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Disease and wishing many more years of leadership in conducting and supporting biomedical research. I too also want to thank no Novo Nordis uh, for their work on diabetes both in the lab and in communities like mine which has a prevalence of diabetes that's hi far higher than the national average. Disease, diabetes is a disease which strikes at every age level and in every racial and ethnic group in America. And while it does still proportionately affect, disproportionately affect the elderly, the fact remains that its prevalence is growing among all groups. In addition to the nearly 24 million people currently living with diabetes, there are 57 million estimated to have prediabetes, putting them at increased risk for developing diabetes and complications therefrom. Particularly disturbing to me is the increase in type 2 diabetes in children and the racial and ethnic differences in prevalence of diagnosed diabetes. When nearly 12% of non-Hispanic blacks, more than 10% of Hispanics, and an unacceptable 16.5% of Native Americans and Alaskan Natives have been diagnosed with diabetes, 
compared to 6.6% in non-Hispanic whites and 75 in Asian Americans, it's undeniable that aggressive action must be taken to address these disparities. It's also alarming that the prevalence of a disease which 100 years ago was unknown to them affects now Native Americans and Alaskan Natives as, at a rate that is more than twice that of their white counterparts. It's because of these disturbing facts that I'm especially pleased to see that Mr. Buford Rowland is present from the National Indian Health Board. Although the diversity that exists among Native American Alaskan Native populations must be recognized, your presence here is certainly a step in the right direction in giving these populations a voice on this issue and ensuring that the diversity that exists on every American health issue is not overlooked or forgotten. It has been over 35 years since the Interagency Committee to Coordinate Diabetes was set up at HHS, and while advances have been made, in that time diabetes has exploded, especially in the South, in racial and ethnic minorities, and tattooing children. So I look forward to exploring today what's going to change going forward so that we can reverse this uh, really um, terrible trend that we're seeing in, in our country. Yes, well, will the gentlelady yield to me before she yields back, just for a friendly purpose? Cer Certainly. Uh, early, early, I think, and I thank I thank the gentlewoman uh, early, a member on our side of the aisle, uh, recognized a couple of physicians on on the committee on the subcommittee, and he failed to mention uh, Dr. Christensen, who has uh, came to this Congress from the Virgin Islands, having practiced family medicine there for many years, and she knows of what she speaks. So I just wanted to recognize this, that fact. Thank you for that. I yield back now. Thanks. We thank the gentlewoman. Uh, next is uh, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Space. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I will uh, enter my uh, opening statement into the record uh, on the condition that I'll be allotted additional time uh, for my That's how we work. questioning. And I, I would like to thank you, however, for uh, calling this very important hearing. And uh, my gratitude should also go out to uh, Diana DeGette for her leadership and uh, to uh, Ed Whitfield and Fred Upton for joining me in the request for this hearing. Okay. Next is uh, let's see. gentlewoman from Ohio, Ms. Sutton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I too appreciate you holding this hearing today. This is an incredibly important hearing to have. I, like so many members of the uh, subcommittee, care deeply about diabetes, and I am a member of Ms. DeGette's Congressional Diabetes Caucus, and I thank her very much for her tremendous leadership. Uh, yesterday, a young woman from Northeast Ohio, Selena Williams, came into my office. Selena is a 15-year-old and was diagnosed two years ago with type 2 diabetes. As you can imagine, and as some of you in this room have experienced personally, this was an incredibly scary time for Selena and her parents. Now, she was very lucky to be able to participate in a treatment program at Rainbow Babies and Children's Hospital, which is home to a Center for Excellence for Childhood Diabetes Activity and Nutrition. And through Rainbow Babies, Selena and her family joined a program called the TODAY program, which stands for Treatment Options for Type 2 Diabetes and Adolescents and Youth. The TODAY program's goal is to study the best ways to treat type 2 diabetes in children. And in the TODAY program, Selena and her, or her family learned the basic skills that she would need as a diabetic, how to test her blood um, on a whole meter, give insulin shots, and manage high and uh, low blood sugars. And she also learned through home visits with a certified diabetes nurse how to make lifestyle changes to help her and her entire family be healthier, such as how to read food labels, manage portions, and stay active. And through the Today program, Selena has improved her health. And she recently did something that she said she never thought she would do. Uh, she tried out for the freshman basketball team, and I'm proud to report that she made it. Um, sadly, there are millions of, of uh, children like Selena, but not all children have the same treatment opportunities or educational pro uh, programs that Selena has had. But all of those children have great potential. And the fact that they don't have that opportunity is heartbreaking. So I look forward to hearing about the progress that's been made since the, in the battle against diabetes and about the work that still needs to be done and what we can do to help. Thank you, and I yield back. Thank you. Next is the uh, gentlewoman from Illinois, Ms. Schakowsky. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, if for no other reason we should, as uh, policymakers and as taxpayers, pay very close attention to diabetes. According to a Mathematica report by Drs. Marsha Gold and Renette uh, Briefel, diabetes costs the government, co just the government cost, $80 billion a year in medical costs. That's Medicare and Medicaid, and I'm sure veterans health care, et cetera. The um, CDC's testimony reports that national costs for 2007 exceeded $218 billion dollars. That includes private insurance. So if we were to really um, target diabetes in terms of research, in terms of the kinds of public education programs that Congresswoman Sutton talked about, um, and in controlling this disease, we would also be able to save billions of dollars and change lives forever. Um, diabetes is really a, a very cruel disease that affects 23.6 million Americans. It's cruel to young children who have to draw blood every day, monitor their 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 sugar and their and their their diet, um, in which is a good thing for all children, but in the ways that diabetic children have to do, it's really difficult. And to millions of adults who develop diabetes later in life, particularly for type two, 2, where there really are lifestyle kinds of changes that can be, that can be made, um, we, we need to invest in public health programs. And for um, all the rest of diabetes type 1 and also type 2, we need to invest in research. So I, I want to thank Congresswoman DeGette, who has been a champion for her throughout her career here and even earlier on addressing this uh, Im important disease, important in so many ways, and, and a, um, a disease that we can, in so many ways, effectively address. So let's do it. I yield back. Thank you. And next is the gentlewoman from Wisconsin, Ms. Baldwin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, Ranking Member Shimkus for calling this uh, hearing today. And I, too, want to uh, echo my uh, colleagues' uh, comments uh, in, of gratitude toward, for the leadership of, of my friend Diana get on this issue. Um, I, I also want to welcome all the witnesses that we have uh, today. We're very much looking forward to hearing your testimony. Diabetes cl clearly has a sweeping impact on our society. And in that vein, I'd like to share the story today of a very brave family making a tremendous difference in my district and across the state of Wisconsin. The Wickmans are just like many other American families. They uh, love the outdoors. They love to take road trips on weekends. And they would do anything for their children. Yet this family has really been ravaged by uh, diabetes. Uh, Grandpa Rick has type 2 diabetes and just had to have his foot amputated recently. Um, their daughter, Stella, uh, just four years old, has type 1 uh, uh, diabetes and has to have her finger pricked uh, dozens of times each day to make sure that her uh, uh, blood sugar level is at uh, safe levels. Um, this disease infiltrates every waking moment of their lives. You know, the Wickmans discovered that Stella was sick on a family trip to the uh, Upper Peninsula of Michigan after a midnight ambulance ride and an admission to a pediatric ICU. Um, since that day, they really could have sat back and bemoaned uh, their uh, uh, fate, but instead they've really thrown themselves into helping Stella and the many children like her across the country by championing the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation of Western Wisconsin. They also carry the torch of another Wisconsin hero, uh, Jesse Altswager. Um, Jesse traveled extensively uh, in his young life, educating others about uh, diabetes. He even testified before a panel here in Congress um, in support of stem cell research. Jesse uh, died due to complications of ju juvenile diabetes in February of this year at age uh, 13, but his legacy clearly uh, lives on. In my hometown at the University of Wisconsin, the progress towards better treatment is real. 
Uh, an FDA-approved clinical trial is currently underway for the use of adult stem cells in the treatment of type 1 diabetes. This study is co-sponsored uh, jointly by um, OSIRIS Therapeutics and the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation. Researchers are specifically targeting newly diagnosed type 1 diabetes patients who still have some functioning beta cells left. An infusion of targeted stem cell therapy could stop the immune destruction and um, uh, preserve individuals' remaining ability to make insulin. Um, perhaps the most exciting news for both the Wickmans and researchers in uh, the district that I represent is the passage of the comprehensive health care reform legislation uh, earlier this year. This year, the bill bans insurers from citing pre-existing conditions uh, as a reason to refuse to insure children in America and to ensure that a, a child like Stella uh, will never be without health care coverage. And this year, uh, that piece of legislation invests $126 million through the new Prevention and Public Health Fund to help create uh, the necessary infrastructure to prevent, detect, and manage chronic diseases like diabetes. So clearly, much work remains to be done. So as we work to implement uh, this legislation, we must remember the toll that diabetes takes on our families and on our health care system. But we must also work to improve and expand existing federal programs that are making a difference today. And I'm glad that our witnesses are here uh, to help inform that process. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, and thank you again to our witnesses. Thank you, and I think that concludes our members' opening statements. So we'll now move to our witnesses. Let me introduce and, well, first welcome you both and um, introduce the two of you. On my left is Dr. Judith Fradkin, who is Director of the Division of Diabetes and Endocrinology and Metabolic Diseases at the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases at the National Institutes of Health. Fradkin, did I pronounce that properly? Okay. And then is um, Ann Albright, who is Director of the Division of Diabetes Translation of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And thank you both for being here. I think you know the drill, five-minute speeches. Uh, and then if you want to submit additional written comments, you can. And I'll start with Dr. Albright. Mr. Chairman, Mr. Shimkus, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for the opportunity to participate in the hearing. I am Dr. Ann Albright. I'm the director of the Diabetes Division at CDC. I'm trained as an exercise scientist and nutritionist, but I also have lived with type 1 diabetes for 42 years. The Diabetes Division at CDC translates the science of diabetes into practical strategies to control and prevent uh, diabetes in the U.S. population, and I'll be describing some of our work in uh, surveillance to define and monitor diabetes, the reduction of the risk factors, the prevention of type 2 diabetes, and management of this disease. The ability to identify and the magnitude of a problem through ongoing surveillance is a foundation of CDC's work. CDC developed and maintains the National Diabetes Surveillance System. It's the world's first system for monitoring diabetes. It relies on national and state-based household telephone and hospital-based surveys, vital statistics to monitor trends in diabetes. In the last two years, CDC has developed a methodology to estimate levels of diabetes and obesity at the county level, providing policymakers and communities with new information to guide programming and resource allocation. CDC, in collaboration with NIH, has also initiated the largest major surveillance system to quantify and track type 1 and type 2 diabetes in those under 20 years of age, called Search for Diabetes in Youth. Among other things, search shows us to, allows us to clarify the degree to which type 2 diabetes is affecting youth of different racial and ethnic backgrounds. Findings from our national surveillance system document several increases or successes in the public health response to diabetes over the past decade, but have also revealed areas of major concern and continuing threats to the public's health. Rates of blood glucose being out of control, amputations, and end-stage renal disease among adults have declined. However, considerable variation and disparities in diabetes care and outcomes remain. CDC does work to impact and improve outcomes for women with and at risk for gestational diabetes. 
in collaboration with the National Association of Chronic Disease Directors and the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, we have established a five-state collaboration to identify, catalog, and validate routinely collected data about gestational diabetes, identify gaps in documenting prevalence, and determine implications for care. Our greatest concern, though, is the continued uh, increase in the rate of new cases of diabetes. This is evident in virtually all segments of society. This continued increase in the rate of development of new cases and is unfortunately negating many of the successes that clinical and public health efforts have achieved in reducing the rates of complications. The continued increase in diabetes at incidence calls for a comprehensive implementation of a diabetes prevention strategy. So CDC is engaged in risk reduction efforts on multiple levels, including focus on obesity uh, for the general population, but the diabetes division focuses on those at highest risk for diabetes. So these are very complementary efforts. And in fact, we have focused much of our work in the Native American community, helping uh, mem many members achieve vouchers for uh, nutrition uh, foods, particularly fruits and vegetables. And the use of those vouchers has been in excess of 50 percent. So a very tangible, concrete example of a way to reduce those risk factors. Based on the findings of the NIH-led Diabetes Prevention Program clinical trial, CDC is now actually translating those findings into practice. Um, we are able to do this with our partners. Uh, at the top of the leading role is the YMCA of USA and United Health Group, and we're able to offer this for about $250 to $300 a person. This is the first time ever that a private health insurer has joined forces with a national community-based organization to deliver this work, and we're focusing on training the workforce, on recognizing those programs for quality assurance, for actually investing in delivery of the programs, and for health marketing so people know where to go and how to get those programs. We're also preventing complications in diabetes, and we have research trials that we've been doing, the triad study. We're taking those findings and we're working with our state-based diabetes and prevention and control programs to actually put those into practice and change what healthcare systems are actually delivering as a result of that study. I want to just close with two new projects that we have going on that are exciting. And one is uh, the national program to eliminate diabetes-related disparities in vulnerable populations. We will now be funding six organizations that will focus on reducing the mortality and premature uh, mortality and morbidity. And we will be helping this by helping these communities to organize, plan, and implement effective strategies. And finally, we'll also be initiating a new platform of research studies to examine the impact of population-targeted policies emanating from health systems, business and community organizations, and the governments. So several steps have been taken to improve the STEM, the diabetes epidemic. Work in risk factor reduction must continue so fewer people develop prediabetes. The programs and policies for obesity and prevention and control are critical. There is a critical need for effective programs that prevent people with prediabetes from developing the disease, and the first steps have been taken in the form of the National Diabetes Prevention Program. The complications of diabetes have a very high cost in terms of dollars and human suffering, and while improvements have been made, much work remains to be done, especially in those vulnerable populations. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Albright. Dr. Fradkin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee. And I also want to thank you for your congratulations on our 60th anniversary, and particularly to thank um, Congresswoman DeGette and Mr. Space and Mr. Green, who actually participated in our celebratory breakfast. And uh, Ms. DeGette, in particular, made some remarkably in inspiring remarks at that, at that uh, event, and I want to thank her. I'm also very pleased to testify with Dr. Albright because our two agencies work so effectively together on multiple efforts to combat diabetes, including our National Diabetes Education Program, which is co-led by the two agencies. On behalf of NIDDK and the NIH, I'm pleased to report that we are vigorously pursuing research on diabetes and its complications, and today I would like to tell you about some of that NIH-supported research, including research supported by the Special Statutory Program for Type 1 Diabetes Research, which is administered by NIDDK and has resulted in many scientific advances that are improving the health and quality of life of people with diabetes. A parallel funding stream, the Special Diabetes Program for Indians, is administered by the Indian Health Service and has led to substantial improvements in diabetes care in American Indians. Mr. Chairman, the need to pursue research on prevention, treatment, and cure of diabetes is greater than ever because the rates of several types of diabetes are rising. 
The good news is that we've made tremendous progress in recent years, which has led to improvements in survival and quality of life for people with diabetes. For example, now thanks to continuous glucose monitoring technology, some parents of young children with type 1 diabetes can sleep through the night without having to rise repeatedly to check their child's blood glucose level. The device measures glucose every several minutes and sounds an alarm if the levels are too high or too low, a technological peace of mind allowing pa parents to sleep more soundly. Because genetic and antibody tests can predict with great accuracy which children will develop type 1 diabetes, we can now test prevention strategies and are doing so. To find new approaches to prevention, we launched the TEDDY study. TEDDY researchers screened over 400,000 newborns to find uh, 8,000 8, who had genes that put them for particularly high risk of type 1 diabetes. Those children are now enrolled in the study and are being followed until age 15 with a goal of identifying environmental triggers of type 1 diabetes. For example, if we could find an infectious trigger, we might uh, develop a vaccine to prevent the disease. To date, the number of children who have developed autoimmunity and type 1 diabetes are exactly as predicted in the study, showcasing the tremendous power of these predictive tests. We can prevent or delay the development of type 2 diabetes in people at high risk for disease, as demonstrated by the NIDDK-led Landmark Diabetes Prevention Program clinical trial that Dr. Albright mentioned. A modest amount of weight loss through diet changes and moderate exercise substantially reduced the occurrence of type 2 diabetes at three years and now in the most recent report at 10 years after enrollment in the trial. This intervention worked in all the ethnic and racial groups studied in both men and women and in women with a history of gestational diabetes. Building on this success, NIDDK supports research to translate these results to people who can benefit from them. For example, just this week, NIDDK-supported scientists announced exciting results from research in which community health workers effectively delivered a group-based lifestyle intervention to people at high risk for type 2 diabetes. At one year, the participants lost as much weight as was observed in the Diabetes Prevention Program, suggesting that this approach may be a low-cost way to reach Americans. Another NIDDK-supported pilot study is already having a far-reaching impact. Researchers successfully utilized local YMCAs to deliver a lower-cost, group-based DPP lifestyle intervention. And Dr. Albright has provided information about how the CDC is building on the results of this NIDDK-supported research to improve the public health by implementing a national diabetes prevention program. Diabetes during pregnancy brings risk to mother and child. Because of the NIH-supported hyperglycemia and adverse pregnancy outcome study, we now have precise information on what blood glucose levels should be during pregnancy to avoid complications near birth. These are just a few examples of how far we've come in recent years through vigorous support of research toward increasing knowledge about diabetes and improving the health of people with diabetes. However, much work remains to be done to curb the diabetes epidemic. For example, it's critical to move beyond continuous glucose monitoring technology and link glucose monitoring to insulin delivery to create the so-called artificial pancreas. This technology could help patients achieve blood glucose control that has been shown to reduce complications and also alleviate the burden of self-care. Now that we have thousands of samples collected through the TEDDY study, it's vital to use new and emerging technology to analyze those samples and identify an environmental trigger of type 1 diabetes. Building on the success of the many new available therapies for type 2 diabetes, comparative effectiveness research can help inform doctors' decisions about what medications to prescribe for their patients and when. Loss of the insulin-producing beta cells underlies both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Research through NIDDK's Beta Cell Biology Consortium may develop new approaches to treatment by providing insights on how to reprogram cells to become insulin-producing cells, stimulate beta cell replication, or replace lost beta cell function with cells derived from stem cells. Complementing these efforts, clinical research can provide information on how best to preserve beta cell function in people newly diagnosed with type 1 or type 2 diabetes. Perhaps most important to combating the diabetes epidemic is reversing the trend of both type 1 and type 2 diabetes occurring at younger ages. Because earlier disease onset 
means earlier development of complications and premature mortality. For women, earlier development of diabetes also endangers her offspring. The intrauterine environment plays an important role not only in problems at the time of birth, but also in the future development of diabetes and obesity, a finding observed among the Pima Indians in Arizona. Thus, it is critical to pursue research to break the vicious cycle of ever-growing rates of diabetes by preventing or mitigating the effects of diabetes and obesity during the childbearing years and pregnancy. Implementing research findings into clinical practice had led to reductions in rates of heart disease, kidney failure, and blindness in people with diabetes. By building on recent advances in diabetes research, we are poised to realize even greater improvements in health and quality of life for people with diabetes. We have come far, but we must go farther. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your leadership in calling this hearing to focus attention on the problem and for your continued support of NIH research. Thank you, Dr. Frag. And now we're going to have questions uh, from the members of the, of the subcommittee, and I'll start with myself uh, for five minutes. Uh, as you both know, the diabetes, I guess it's mulatus, interagency coordinating committee is in the midst of finalizing a diabetes research strategic plan. It's the first comprehensive research plan to be released in several years. I understand it's going to describe the future direction for 10 major diabetes research areas. And Dr. Fratkin, if I could start with you, can you briefly summarize the major focus areas of this report? And then I was going to ask Dr. Albright. Um, she identifies the increasing rate of new diabetes cases as an area of great concern for CDC. So how do you think that plan will help stem the diabetes epi epidemic? I'll start with Dr. Fratkin. Thank you. So NIDDK is pleased to chair the DMICC, which includes participation uh, from CDC and multiple agencies across HHS and, and throughout the government and really serves as a very effective organization to bring us together to share information and develop plans. So we have developed um, with uh, the help of over 100 um, external uh, researchers uh, chapters focusing on each of 11 critical opportunities. And these range from very basic areas such as autoimmunity and the beta cell function that I was telling you about to needs uh, with regard to uh, comparative effectiveness research and translational research to um, build um, uh, translation from clinical research into um, translational research. And we have identified a number of opportunities for important clinical trials that we would like to undertake um, if funds are available, as well as some key opportunities utilizing new uh, genomics, proteomics uh, technologies to try to elucidate the basis of diabetes so that we can develop uh, new strategies for prevention and cure. All right, thanks. Dr. Albright, um, as I mentioned, how is this new plan going to stem the diabetes epidemic looking at the rate of new diabetes cases? There certainly is continued research that needs to be done in, in developing ways to reduce the onset of diabetes in those that have prediabetes and reducing the risk factors so people don't even enter into the world of prediabetes. So particularly the, the trend, there will be certainly chapters in this plan that will help with those more basic biologic mechanistic work, which is critical. But importantly, this plan also includes a chapter on translational research, and that's an area that CDC and NIH and others share. Um, we both have a role to play in the translation of, of the basic science into practice. So there will be questions and, and guidance in that chapter for how to identify those areas that are real world, in which you take what we learn in a laboratory or in a contained setting, and now you've got to take it out to the real world. So it's important that we have studies that allow us to make those transitions. And then certainly from CDC's perspective, we then take that information and try to scale it and sustain it and be sure that there's a much broader reach. Otherwise, the discoveries that we made end up with a very limited uh, reach, and that's not effective for the investment in research. We need to be sure that we get it out to as many people as we possibly can. All right. Dr. Robert, let me ask you this. You, you talked about um, you know, trying to promote fresh vegetables, uh, fresh fruit, that type of thing. Um, you know, I, I, I actually uh, am still the uh, vice chair of the Native American Caucus, and I've taken an interest in, you know, diabetes as pertains to Native Americans in particular, and also in urban areas. And, and I've always felt that, you know, the biggest problem is, you know, not having access to fresh fruits and vegetables. We 
I know that ima- I remember when I went to the Tohoto Odom Reservation years ago, and you know they were a desert people that relied on just you know nuts and fruits and things they gather in the desert, and all of a sudden they're eating you know processed cheese and tacos and all this kind of stuff, and um, and I know that they've made an effort there to try to go back to some of the you know subsistence agriculture, but I, it's often difficult for people, you know, like I know, I take my kids to McDonald's. One day I was at McDonald's and I just, you know, McDonald's is now starting to offer like salads and fruits and different things that are better, but you, if you stand there for half an hour, nobody orders any of that. They still order the burgers and everything. So um, how do you d- how do you d- promote this effectively? And, and also, is there alternatives? Like, you know, some people have suggested that maybe use dietary supplements, vitamins, because if people don't take aren't going to, you know, eat the fresh fruits and vegetables or some way, other way to supplement their, their diet, um, you know, through vitamins or whatever. I don't know. I, I, it just seems like we're, even though there are a lot of people out there trying to, you know, to, to promote the fresh fruits and everything, that we continue to lose the battle, not just amongst uh, Native Americans, but just in general. I mean, I know it's co- sort of a comment, but if you could just... How do we get there, and, and, and are there alternatives like supplements that can be used instead? I think that some of the things that we are trying that have an evidence basis behind them, and that's first important, that what we do try has an evidence basis behind it. I think part of the challenge is that we haven't been able to implement these on a large enough scale to have the kind of impact. We do have to change the culture and change the environment so that the healthier choice is the easier choice for people. And that can have to do with pricing strategies and other kinds of things that make it easier. So it's availability, um, both from a geographic, you don't have to hike 10 miles to get an orange and you can reach right next to you and get a 52 ounce soda. So we've, we've really got to make access to those things easier. That can be supported by policies and by pricing, other sorts of things that may help with that. Um, so, and it is uh, going to require a culture change. As far as supplements, they may have a role to play if people are not getting adequate nutrition, but really our major challenge is that people are over-consuming calories. So we do have to consider ways to reduce caloric consumption, um, and that's what's resulting in the obesity epidemic and increase the physical activity opportunities, which again is another situation where people need to have safer places to be physically active and, and know what they can do to improve their health. So while there certainly may be a role for supplements and vitamins and minerals as a dietitian, I often recommend that, that people are taking those, but they're not a replacement or an answer for reducing caloric intake and increasing physical activity. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Shimkus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have to continue my role as the burr underneath the saddle of the majority and the loyal opposition sometimes. Um, but I need to stand up for McDonald's and understand that the market, if, they would, if, they, if they're not making any profit off those salads, they, they just wouldn't be selling them. But they don't sell that many. But they must be selling enough to, to keep it on the menu board, I think. Maybe that's I th- what I'm with, what I'm with <laughs> my son. He, <laughs> My son used to get the apples over the fries, but now he's moving. He's older. He's, he is moving to the fries now. But, uh, <laughs> but I mean, but that's a real issue. I mean, they wouldn't. They are marketing and they are selling. And if they weren't, th- you know, they're doing it for the bottom line. And I, uh, but it's an educational aspect. And so when parents are taking their kids in, you know, the parents can also choose healthy. They can set the example for the kids. But, but I just wanted to put the aside thing. And I also want to put down the. Uh, the first of the health care laws, $569 billion in tax increases starts today with the $2.7 billion tax on tanning services. So just got a little blurb on that. I want to put that on the record. Um, we could sell something we can celebrate. The, um, uh, now, this is more in line with your visit here, um, and, I, and I do appreciate it. And it's a little technical. So I've I got to read some of this stuff. Um, you all, CDC and uh, NIH through through uh, this this section uh, shows the positive benefits of lifestyle intervention, diet, and physical exercise to individuals with type two diabetes. Plus, it has been known that the diet plays a major role in treatment and management of t- type one diabetes. And we were talking about that. In fact, insulin's effectiveness requires diet interventions to manage diabetes and slow the progression of diabetes comorbidities. 
primarily cardiovascular kidney and i complications again something that we were you were just uh, referring to uh, mr chairman uh, so this is a question directing about the registered dietitians who provide medical nutrition therapy which for a decade since the Benefits Improvement Protection Act, BIPA, as a lot of us like to will say, passed, has been a Medicare Part B covered intervention for diabetes, chronic kidney disease. Under the health care law, the Affordable Care Act states that co-payment and deductible fees are waived for the prevention interventions recommended by the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force with a grade A or B. CMS recently released proposals, rules for Section 4104, the medical nutrition therapy was given a grade B. So the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force recommends intensive behavioral diet counseling for cardiovascular and other diet-related chronic diseases. Does CDC believe diet interventions for cardiovascular risk factors such as high blood pressure and high cholesterol for pre-diabetes and other diet-related chronic diseases should be included with diabetes and chronic kidney disease in Medicare Part B medical nutrition therapy? Whew. I know it's a lot, and I had to read it. So, And, and if this, this is too big and voluminous, uh, you know, if you could respond in writing or get back to us on that unless you kn know the answer. Sure, I, I can't speak to the specific official position of our agency. I, what I would offer, though, is to think about those services that you're describing, which are education and counseling. Those are important services. They, they will have limited impact if they're not undergirded and supported by other interventions that focus on making the opportunities for people easier to get to so that the advice they get from their dietitian, and I advise patients as a dietitian, they have to go home to their settings. And if those do not support easier opportunities to get those healthy foods and to participate in physical activity, it makes it more difficult to implement the advice that they're being given by their registered dietitian, whether it's for hypertension or for uh, diabetes. So there are other opportunities to help support that education and counseling so that it can actually have the best impact it could possibly have. But it does need to be supported by these other options and other sorts of things that al allow people to make that choice, the healthy choice, much easier for them to make. And if I may, um, the uh, has a common fund which was established in the NIH reauthorization law been used to coordinate diabetes research across NIH? Uh, Dr. Fratkin, do you know? So the common fund is, is actually focused on Oh, please, oh, yeah, let's, if the chairman will allow. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Shimkus. Uh, next is the gentlewoman from Colorado, Ms. Deget. Thank you. Dr. Fredkin, my, my first question is um, nicely piggyback on, on Mr. Shimkus's question uh, because one of the big concerns of the Diabetes Caucus for a long time has been the disparities between minority populations like African Americans, Latinos, and American Indians and Alaska Natives and, and um, Anglos, and we're not really sure why those disparities exist other than a combination of factors of, of health access, community environment, genetics, 
So I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about any ongoing research by NIH to address the cause of the disparities, because until we find out the cause, we can't really address how to deal with it. Right. We need more research to look at that, but if that's the case, then it really shows that we're not necessarily getting those research people or those developers of the data out there to address those issues. Right, which which means you're gonna have different therapies for those groups. And then, then we have some groups uh, like the Pima Indians we were talking about earlier where where they have a huge percentage of their populations with type two diabetes and it could be not that not necessarily those groups, um, dietary habits or exercise habits are that much worse than a comparable other population, but that there's some kind of genetic propensity or something else that we could use. Is that right? Absolutely. Yeah. And ju just for the commercial portion of my of my questioning, um, we have this minority disparities legislation, which has attempted to deal with this exact issue. And Dr. Christensen has been a huge help, and some of the other caucuses, Mr. Chairman. So we should really look at that bill too as as we move along. Um, I want to ask uh, Dr. Albright you very briefly about. Um, uh, this new report that came out from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation this last uh, this week, and uh, unfortunately, it's called F is for fat, and it says that the intensity, uh, the the rate of obesity continues to increase in 2010, particularly in the Hispanic and African American subpopulations, and this is despite all of CDC's public health campaigns to improve diet choices and activities and everything else. I'm wondering uh, what CDC's strategy is to try to reverse this trend. I know CDC's been working assiduously on it, but it just seems every time we get one of these reports, it's worse and worse. My state of Colorado is almost always the best state, but that doesn't mean it's good because it just means the, the rate of obesity is lower than other places. It doesn't mean people aren't obese. I'm wondering if you can talk about, about uh, how we can ramp up our efforts to reverse these trends. Certainly a significant issue and one that's going to require a multi-pronged approach. I think that's one of the things we all have to remember is that there isn't a simple single answer for this. It is multi multifactorial. Uh, other divisions within CDC and other agencies in the federal government are certainly tackling and taking on obesity, particularly working on childhood obesity, so starting early in life and trying to change those habits early in life. They're also working on things related to adult obesity prevention and treatment issues. Much of the focus is turning toward policies and changing the built environment that will help with that. We, there will need to be some time in order to determine the impact of those broader changes in policy that should have a much bigger impact on a larger segment of the population. Thank you. One last question for you, Dr. Fragkin. Um, going back to the special diabetes funding that we're trying to get reauthorized, um, what benefits, if any, does the multi-year funding stream in that program provide to the ability to fund the most promising research in the field, and how important is that multi-funding aspect of the special diabetes program? Let me give you an example of one thing that we did with this special funding that absolutely required multi-year funding. We created a program for career development, research career development for researchers studying childhood 
diabetes. So we gave funds to the institutions that had very, very strong programs in pediatric diabetes research, which enabled them to recruit in promising new investigators with the promise of five years of career support. And I can tell you that some of the people supported through that program have already made tremendous con contributions. So for example, at Yale, um, one of the investigators who was supported through that program has already got NIH funding and is working on trying to close the, the loop. And in fact, three out of four of the people supported at Yale are now junior faculty there. We had to stop that program because we don't have five years of funding remaining. And so as a result, we couldn't offer people five years of uh, career development support. That's just a, a specific kind of an example, but I think it kind of gives the, the flavor of why it is important. A and many of the things that we're doing, like Teddy, where we have to follow kids until they you know, are 15, just clearly require a sustained stream of funding. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Gentleman from Georgia, Mr. Gingrey. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Dr. Dr. Fradkin, you were responded to one of my colleagues just a few minutes ago, and uh, this is not an exact quote, but you essentially said, uh, when the United States Preventative Services Task Force gives something a low grade, uh, it often means that it hasn't been well studied. Uh, I would like to ask you uh, your opinion in regard to the low grade that, uh, that they, the United States Preventative Services Task Force, gave regarding screening mammography for women in their 40s to uh, either prevent or early detection of breast cancer. Do you have any thought on that? I really have not followed screening mammography closely. That's that's not in in my area. But you are a medical doctor, so uh, you know I, I think probably the you know the the grade that that concerns us in particular relates to their their grade on you know screening for for identifying people with diabetes and with prediabetes, where the quality of evidence that it would require for them to recommend supporting that would require many, many years because simply identifying people with diabetes or prediabetes doesn't rise to the stat status that they require to find something effective. You have well, to actually well let me, show Let me pull back just for a second, then I'll let you continue. And, and, and uh, because I, 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 the reason I ask you that, I do have some real serious concerns because you know that uh, in, in the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act of 2010, sometimes referred to as Obamacare, uh, that this uh, this task force uh, will begin uh, pretty darn soon to not just recommend but to mandate, uh, and I think it's really important that we we take a very very close look at that. But uh, let me go ahead and shift to the area in which you're uh, now in involved, of course, in uh, uh, with some 57 million Americans estimated uh, today to have prediabetes. Uh, strategies to prevent or delay the progression to type 2, uh, type 2 diabetes, are critical to stemming the burden of diabetes on patients and our health care system. Do, do you think the existing guidelines sufficiently address the needs of patients with prediabetes, or is it more important or more attention needed to ensure these patients have access to the most appropriate treatment options? My concern being that you know, we know a lot of people have prediabetes. I think you gave a figure, uh, an astoundingly large figure, but uh, are we doing enough to really prevent them to, from progressing to uh, full-blown type 2 diabetes? So I think this is, this is where the, the kind of joint effort that, that Dr. Albright and I have been talking about is particularly important. We at NIH are doing research to try to figure out how to most cost-effectively prevent diabetes in those patients. We have a very strong uh, program looking at multiple different uh, ways to achieve prevention and specifically looking at culturally sensitive approaches, looking at what works best in particular populations. And then CDC, and, and actually it's wonderful to see even private payers, you know, building on the results of our research to try then to create public health programs that give people access to the things that the research has shown was effective. But clearly our research 
shows that about 90% of people with prediabetes don't even know that they have um, prediabetes, and most of them are not taking effective steps to try to reduce their risk. Uh, thank you, Dr. Fradkin. Uh, well, Dr. Albright, again, regarding that, and uh, you mentioned uh, the vast majority of cases of diabetes in the United States today are preventable in certainly these, these many people with prediabetes. Pre what are the top things that can be done to prevent these cases from progressing? At this point, the evidence that we have suggests really scaling up and making this National Diabetes Prevention Program widely available to people. We are now offering it. CDC is providing funding to 11 sites. United Health Group is providing it to six. They have agreed to take over coverage of their beneficiaries. So it's a very good public-private model. We'll get the ball rolling in some of these locations, and the private insurer can take over and continue to uh, reimburse as time goes on. And so that's a nice combination. Um, but we do need to get to more places and get to more locations, particularly harder to reach places. We need more uh, entities that can deliver this in addition to the YMCA USA, who is outstanding, and other additional third-party payers. So we've got the, the beginning infrastructure there, and it's time now for us to expand that infrastructure and allow it to have reach across the country. Well, thank you, Dr. Albright, Dr. Fradkin, and I'll yield back. Thank you both. Thank you, Mr. Gingry. Next is the gentlewoman from the Virgin Islands, Ms. Christensen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I want to thank you both for your, your testimony and your answers thus far. Um, Dr. Albright, you mentioned um, working with five states and six organizations. Do, do they um, have a good mix of uh, the population, uh, a good population mix? Yes. Um, they you didn't mention what states they were. Or yeah, we are not public. We can't publicly announce them yet yeah. because the reviews have just been done. But that's uh, we we work to pay special attention to that. Um, we first look for the best applicants. Um, certainly, that's number one. But we are working and always seek to assure a wide representation of states and more territories and Pacific jurisdictions as well. We do provide funding to all of the U.S. affiliated. Uh, territories, so we are eager to have them involved as well. I just wanted to make sure that there was diversity in, in, in yes in represented in, in those states and organizations. Um, uh, both of you have talked about the, um, the importance of the social and economic determinants of health, um, and certainly those are, that's some of the reason why we've, we, we haven't been able to make the impact in the African American, Native American, Hispanic communities. Um, I've been supporting having a executive order similar to the one that the president, that President Clinton had um, issued uh, back in '98, I guess, around environmental justice, requiring that all agencies of government, all the departments, uh, do health impact uh, assessments on their policies and programs and actually go beyond that to try to address some of the social and economic environmental issues uh, through their policies. Do you think that, um, is that something that you could both support? Because it seems as though we're not going to make any progress as long as people live in food deserts, um, have, you know, all of the uh, socio and economic and environmental barriers to improving their health. I can certainly say that CDC's focus is growing in that area under the leadership of our agency director, Dr. Tom Frieden. We certainly are focused on policies and environmental changes that will support that, and, and really one of the themes at CDC is really seeking health in all policies. Yes, so that's basically. That. Yes, uh, it is going to take, it, it, because it's so multifactorial of, of a problem, we do have to consider and evaluate the kinds of things that we are doing to try to make an inroads in these very broad areas in our society. But it's critical that we do investigate them and find solutions within these multiple areas. Maybe I could just speak to one specific investigation that we have, have done in this regard that we actually just reported um, the results on this past week, and that was a huge study in which we um, s looked at the environment in 42 middle schools focusing on schools that predominantly served minority and low-income students. Uh, 50 percent were Hispanic, uh, over 20 percent were African-American, 
most of them were on uh, free or reduced lunch. And we looked in those schools at changing the food services, increasing the physical activity, and also promoting behavioral change. And we got some, some positive results. We didn't get everywhere we, we wanted to be, but we saw reductions in obesity in the kids who started overweight or obese, which was half the kids in these schools were overweight or obese, and, and those children had reduced obesity as a result. Um, of this intervention, decreased waist circumference, decreased levels of insulin. So some, you know, some positive impacts on risk factors for type 2 diabetes. And this is the kind of societal intervention that I think, you know, NIH likes to, you know, do, do research to, you know, test. And then when we, you know, when we see results from studies like this, you know, then the public health uh, agencies uh, move to try to translate that. Thank you. I'll yield back to um, Mr. Chambers. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Space, for eight minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you again for uh, uh, exhibiting uh, your commitment to such an important issue by uh, convening this hearing. Uh, where to begin? Uh, Dr. Albright, uh, your testimony, uh, and actually uh, both of your testimony, I think, uh, under uh, underlines the increase that we're seeing in all types of uh, diabetes. Um, and your testimony briefly alludes to, and I, I think uh, uh, some of my colleagues have referenced it very specifically, the cost that uh, this is visiting upon our country. And uh, just uh, doing a little bit of uh, quick math, Assuming that we're somewhere north of $200 billion a year now, which I know is uh, probably true. I know the ADA's study from a couple of years ago, 2007, was at $174 billion. Uh, that computes to over a half a billion dollars a day uh, that this disease is uh, costing our society. And as Ms. Schakowsky pointed out, uh, much of that is a direct governmental expenditure. Um, and to put it in perspective, uh, in 2009, we spent $148 billion on two wars in this country. And uh, now we're spending uh, upwards of $200 billion a year uh, dealing with the effects of this one disease that has taken several different forms. Uh, is it a safe assumption that uh, with the increase in uh, incidence of diabetes that these costs will continue to escalate? Uh, yes, that would be the short answer. And, and the, uh, much of the cost associated with diabetes uh, consists of treating the complications of diabetes, correct? They certainly, uh, they, they certainly are associated with the cost of, of treatment. Fortunately, as we've said, there are ways for us now to prevent, and we've been trying to work to get those to be delivered as cost-effectively right. as possible. So with the delivery of those preventative mechanisms and maintenance mechanisms, the, in the end you will um, mitigate the total cost associated with treating the complications that you can uh, prevent or reduce through effective maintenance and treatment. And in the end, dollars spent today uh, will, uh, re will result in a significant uh, decrease in dollars spent tomorrow. Is that a safe statement? I think uh, there's some little parameters you have to put around there when you are looking at cost effectiveness. You're very right that you do have to look at the time horizon and you have to look at the assumptions. But there certainly are opportunities for us to drive the cost down in, in treatment and prevention so that we can indeed have more productive citizens who can be contributing to the economy in successful ways. So, yeah, there, there's certainly benefit to doing that. If, uh, if we were to develop a cure for diabetes. Um, and I, I want to, uh, on the subsequent panels, maybe talk a little bit about how we might better do that. But if uh, just uh, hypothetically, if we, we were to develop a cure for uh, diabetes, and that cure can take many different forms. It could be uh, an artificial cure, like uh, the closed loop system that you've referenced. 
uh, or it could be a more natural cure, perhaps uh, someday with embryonic uh, stem cell research. Uh, if, if, uh, if, if you've got a young person that develops diabetes at the age of six or seven years old who's diagnosed with type 1, the complications uh, that, that that child is likely to experience as a result of the disease are not likely to manifest themselves for decades, correct? That's right. So that by the time that child is 40 or 50 years old, his risk for heart disease, blindness, stroke, kidney disease, uh, amputation is much, much higher than it would be for someone who's not diabetic Absolutely. at that age. Um, what I'm trying to drive at here is the future costs of, of this disease, as debilitating as they are today in a society, in a, in a country that can't afford the luxury of uh, $200 billion a year on one disease, as debilitating as these costs are today, can you give us some projection as to where we may be in 20 years or 30 years, given the rather rapid increase in incidence of both type 1 and type 2 diabetes in the event that we do not see a cure and we do not see the implementation on a wide scale of some of the measures that you're testifying about today <coughs> with maintenance? Uh, what will be the implications to the economically to the society in 20 years if, if we continue to go the way we're going now without uh, massive uh, uh, intervention and, and maintenance and or cure? You want to start or do you start? Well, I think obviously uh, the CDC is predicting that one in three children born today and one in two minority children born today will develop type 2 diabetes if, uh, if, if we don't intervene and change things. But I would like to point out that things actually, there are some very real improvements in terms of the prognosis for people with diabetes that have effects on health care costs. So things, because rates of diabetes are increasing so fast, if it weren't for some of the effective things that we're doing to bring down the complications of diabetes, we would be seeing even greater costs than we're seeing today. So, for example, even though rates of end-stage kidney disease, which is a huge expense for Medicare, are going up, the actual proportion of people with diabetes who develop end-stage renal disease is falling. So if we weren't doing those effective interventions, as diabetes is increasing, we would be seeing even greater increase in the cost than we're seeing. I think this is definitely a combination of we are, this is where we are seeing a greater number of people with diabetes, and that's because as people live longer, as we diagnose them earlier, as we catch them, more people have, un less people have undiagnosed diabetes, we are going to have a bigger total prevalence or total population. We want to drive that number down by reducing the new cases so that what resources we have can be delivered to effectively manage those people that have the disease, and then hopefully over time, yes, not have a future of one in three and the devastating complications, so we've got to make headway in preventing all forms of diabetes and better treating diabetes because it also is where we will spend the cost. Yes, it does cost to take care of people with the disease. It does cost to prevent. But the opportunity to not have people suffer the ravages of this disease and continue to be productive members of society is a critical piece to be sure we keep in the discussion about the economics of diabetes. Thank you, doctor. Uh, thank you, doctor. Uh, I uh, regret that I have uh, no additional time. So no, that's all right. I mean, I mean, it's. Uh, I'm glad you don't because we uh, we are going to have a vote. We have three votes. So I'm going to try to get on our other two uh, people Chairman, here. Chairman, be before can. before you recognize, yes. can I just ask unanimous consent to submit a uh, folder of of different statements by different groups about their activities for the record? And this has been cleared with the minority leader group. All right, we'll take a look at it uh, yeah, the, first. They, they've seen it. You have? Yeah. Okay. Without objection, so Thank ordered. You. And I'm going to try to get in Ms. Schakowsky and Mr. Engel, and then we'll let you go and come back after the votes for the second panel. I recognize a gentlewoman from Illinois. I really, uh, I think this is a quick question. There's been a lot of recent news about Avandia, um, the, the drug that's used to, to treat type 2 diabetes by uh, increasing the body sensitivity to insulin. 
Um, two new studies released earlier this week act, add to the body of evidence about the risk of heart attack, stroke, and heart failure among people who take these drugs. Um, and those are, of course, the very things we're trying to prevent with um, preventing by treating diabetes. Ref, uh, the FDA is holding an advisory committee meeting in mid-July where the safety of Avandia will be under review, and I think this is an appropriate action at this time. While the FDA deliberates on the safety of and effectiveness of this drug, I wanted to ask about the underlying research and public health in implications. Dr. Fradkin, in your professional uh, opinion, what are the implications of the, uh, of the recent studies? And I just, if Dr. Albright, if you have anything else to add. Well, let me just say that there are now multiple different classes of drugs that are available to treat type 2 diabetes as a result of research. And uh, rosiglitazone, Avandia, and pioglitazone are members of one of those classes of drugs. Most of the drugs have been approved based on relatively short-term studies that, that show that they're effective in reducing um, glucose. But I think what we really need and what the um, strategic plan that um, the chairman referred to that the DMICC is developing is what we really need is head-to-head -head comparisons of the various drugs that are available for treating type 2 diabetes with longer-term time frames looking not simply at glucose lowering but looking um, at what they do over the course of diabetes in terms of heart disease, in terms of weight gain, in terms of quality of life for people, and we, we, don't, have, we don't have those head-to-head -head, um, comparisons. And so most of the data, like these current studies that you're referring to, are basically analyses of observational studies. They aren't the ideal, rigorous kind of research that you need to answer the question. Um, and the the rigorous research is is something that that we need. So to so let let me ask you, Dr. Albright. Then what what advice would you have for people who are taking Avandia um, right right now? Because it, it it appears that not only do we have to um, reduce the blood sugar, but how we do it is very important. And obviously, more and more research and and studies. Um, scientifically based studies have to be done. But in the meantime, what do we tell them? Well, our response when we're asked and we are asked these questions is that it is critical that people have the discussion with their health care professional because as Dr. Fradkin referenced, there are other treatments. Their particular risks can be very carefully examined and determined. So it's important that people have a conversation with their health care provider because diabetes is a disease where you have to make lots of decisions. And it's imperative that you have a good discussion with your health care provider to make those decisions for you as an individual. Well, all of this really is a, a humbling reminder that we still have a lot to learn about diabetes and that uh, we need to do that. So thank you very much. I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Engel? Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. I'll try to speak uh, very fast. Um, 135,000 women <coughs> excuse me, are diagnosed with uh, gestational diabetes each year as well. I know that Dr. Uh, Burgess spoke about it. He and I are, uh, in have introduced the uh, Gestational Diabetes Act, H.R. 5354, and we've got many co-sponsors, and I hope uh, people on this uh, subcommittee will all co-sponsor it in a bipartisan way. And what our act uh, aims to do is lower the incidence of gestational diabetes and prevent women afflicted with this condition and their children from developing type 2 diabetes. And the legislation creates a research advisory committee headed by CDC to develop multi-site gestational diabetes research projects to enhance surveillance, provides demonstration grants to focus on reducing the incidence of gestational diabetes, and expands basic clinical and public health research investigating gestational diabetes and current treatments and therapies. And I ask unanimous consent for my opening statement to appear in the record. Without objection, so ordered. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me ask the first Dr. Fratkin, I'll at least ask each of you one question. Um, first of all, Doctor, congratulations on the uh, NIH uh, um, uh, National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive Kidney Disease's 60th anniversary. Thank you. Um, it's because of the uh, tremendous support of the National Institute's research toward understanding, preventing, and treating diabetes that we're closer than ever to uh, better fighting and curing the disease. So congratulations. Could you tell me more 
please about the results of the hypoglycemia and adverse pregnancy outcome study. I guess it's the HAPO study. And do you find that expansion of basic clinical and public health research investigating gestational diabetes and obesity during pregnancy, such as the such as our act, uh, would be useful to further develop the insights uh, gained uh, from the uh, hypoglycemia and adverse pregnancy outcome study? I, I can't speak specifically to, to the act, but I, I can tell you that I think gestational diabetes is one of the most important problems uh, confronting us in, in the area of diabetes because not only does it cause problems at the time of birth for both the mother and the child, increasing rates of cesarean section and, and, and injury to the child, but also it puts the mother at increased risk for subsequent um, diabetes. Our diabetes prevention program showed some very positive results in that regard. But also we have data suggesting that the intrauterine environment puts the offspring at increased risk for diabetes and obesity. So you can imagine the vicious cycle that can occur as type 2 diabetes occurs at younger and younger ages, moving toward people developing gestational diabetes or, or even type 2 diabetes during their childbearing years, then the offspring of that pregnancy not only has the genetic risk that it gets from the parents, but also has the increased risk conver conferred by this adverse metabolic environment that also then increases the risk. And so you can imagine sort of a vicious cycle where rates of diabetes will, I will increase at, at, at expanding rates. So this is a cycle that we really uh, need to break. And, and I think the HAPO study has given us some extremely important information showing that adverse effects of hyperglycemia in pregnancy occur at much lower levels of glucose than we previously appreciated. Thank you. Uh, very well said. Dr. Albright, uh, you mentioned in your testimony that women with type 2 diabetes are at increased risk for having babies with birth defects, and uh, women with a history of uh, gestational diabetes should receive targeted intervention strategies to prevent type 2 diabetes before they become pregnant, during pregnancy, postpartum, and between. Can you uh, please describe some of the intervention and educational outreach strategies the CDC is undertaking to increase awareness of gestational diabetes and the risks associated with it? Yes, briefly, we are making special effort in the, dis the diabetes National Diabetes Prevention Program that we mentioned earlier um, to really put recruitment efforts and raising the awareness of women of childbearing years and their risk if they've had GDM for developing type 2 diabetes. And special efforts will be made to really try to seek to get them involved in this program. They are a terrific candidate for the National Diabetes Prevention Program. We also, as part of the National Diabetes Education Program that Dr. Fradkin and I have the honor of working on together, um, we are working on some more gestational diabetes education efforts. We've received some funding from HHS, and NIH will be taking the lead in doing some comparative effectiveness work with our NDEP materials. So we are continuing to work together in that area. Thank you. And before I yield back, I just want to uh, uh, throw a little accolades to our counsel here to my left, uh, Emily Gibbons. I'm going to thoroughly embarrass her. But she was my long-term uh, legislative director and health person, and, and Mr. Pallone stole her from me. Um, <laughs> with permission. <laughs> with permission. <laughs> and um, she does uh, marvelous work and has done the work for both of us on gestational diabetes. So now that I've thoroughly embarrassed you, I yield back. To I'll Pallone's second right that. Time. I'll second that. Thank you, uh, Mr. Engel. And thank both of you. Uh, this was very helpful. We really appreciate it. And, you know, obviously something that we have to deal with uh, long-term. but. We appreciate your testimony. And what we're going to do is uh, take, uh, we are voting now, we have three votes, should take us to uh, approximately 1.30. So if anybody wants to have lunch, uh, we will reconvene at 1.30 and we'll have our second panel. Thank you. Committee stands in recess.
I, 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 I,